Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Here we are at Nashville, Tennessee for BNY Mellon's 26th Annual Insight Conference. 2,000 financial intermediaries from top asset management firms. We also want to keep you updated on the data. Uh, John was just talking about the ISM services beating estimates. Uh, you're looking at business activity in an 18-month high. This was not this was for the ISM, and then the uh, the services part did really well as well. Let's get to Anthony Avis, chair of the ISM Services Business Committee. What drove the increase. We're over expansion again. We don't have to freak out about slipping <laughs> below 50 as we did last month. What drove it? Well, when you look at the report on business released this morning and you hit it on the head, business activity up 10.3 percentage points to 61.2. We had 13 industries, 13 of the 18 industries reflected growth month over month. Uh, we're measuring that directional change and we had, you know, just under the 50 baseline last month, which showed uh, reflected contraction in the report still above uh, in the positive uh, areas as, as it relates to GDP growth it was a little bit um, like one over 0.1 percent point there but when you look at this what's really uh, driving this is again um, two of the industries in the top four real estate rental and leasing healthcare and social assistance had increases month over month and the picture would even be stronger if the employment was better at 47.1 that's one of the four indexes that make up the composite and that's kind of dragging a bit still as employers are still remaining cautious about hiring so anthony i notice you know not being an expert in this uh some month to month volatility here what's the best way to look at this ism data is it on like a rolling six month kind of basis and if so what's that telling you you know, it's a great question. We look at the data and we always want to see how it trends out. We don't, you know, look at it as just one month. And to your point, I like to look at trends as three to four months. And this is pretty much in line with what we had in our semi-annual forecast going back to December. And most recently, our respondents indicated the second half would be better than the first half. And what we're seeing is this uh, directional change again. And so we're seeing the increases month over month. And so far, the services sector has been uh, fairly resilient and would be even better. Our respondents are very much still concerned about inflation and interest rates. Before I let you go, Anthony, uh, one quick thing. What are the worry spots? Can you just talk us through that a little bit? Well, definitely, uh, we're seeing uh, the geopolitical concerns that have been ongoing. And uh, as I just mentioned, inflation and interest rates. Interest rates, there's numerous comments from our respondents in the report indicating that capital reinvestment is affected, uh, the cost of money. Uh, so those are the two areas that are highlighted as the most concern uh, for our respondents. All right, Anthony, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Anthony Nieves, chair of the ISM Services Business Committee, talking about that data that came out today, uh, better than expected. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We also want to keep you updated on breaking news out of India. Um, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi won some crucial backing from two key allies in his coalition and that allowed him to form a government and extend his decade in power. His party was forced to join uh, with the National Democratic Alliance uh, as well as the Teulu uh, Desam party. So we want to get you an information on what all of that means and how it sets India's growth up going forward. Enda Curran is a uh, global economy reporter at Bloomberg. Uh, he's covered all of this stuff for a very long time. Um, Enda, what did you make of this coalition? What does it mean? How are investors going to take it? Well, what we know is that a deal has now been agreed to set up a government and it gets Prime Minister Modi back into office. So they've done a quick negotiation. It puts an end to the uncertainty on that side of things. Uh, but that's probably about all we know so far. Uh, we don't quite know what's 
behind the deal yet. Obviously, this is a coalition, which means there has to be concessions and trade-offs. It's not clear uh, how that will play out in terms of cabinet postings, policy priorities, and what it means, of course, for economic growth going forward for India. Remember, in the past, India's had coalition governments. One of the great pitches of the Modi government was that it was a strong, stable government, able to push through change and reform. Well, I've seen some economist notes this morning uh, questioning where that will go from here. It's, it's obviously a Modi government, but a weakened Modi government. Uh, so uncertainty on the domestic front. And then, of course, we don't know what it will mean for India on the world stage yet either. India has been the darling of the global economy, one of the fastest growing, emerging as kind of an alternative to China in the middle of the geopolitical arguing with the US, playing a security role in the in the US-led quad, for example, etc. So a very confident place on the world stage for Prime Minister Modi in India. Uh, will that direction now change? Will they carry on as, as they were? I think so. I think a lot of question marks on uncertainty over uh, where this government goes over the months and years ahead. So, Enda, with, with, you know, 24 to 48 hours here of hindsight, is there a, a decent narrative emerging about why Mr. Modi lost so much support that we find ourselves at this point where he has to f- form a coalition government? Like, what happened? I think it'll probably take a little while for that to become fully clear, just, you know, from what our own colleagues New Delhi are saying, it sounds as though economic matters were certainly at least part of it. Uh, inflation and the, and living costs and this feeling that on the one hand, as I mentioned earlier, India had become this kind of global growth star, a standout on the world stage, a new confident kind of outlook, um, maybe capitalizing on the challenges China was facing. But on the ground, listening to our, our colleagues there, they're making the point that maybe that growth story wasn't trickling down or perhaps people on the ground weren't necessarily feeling it was trickling down. Um, so clearly some degree of disaffection. Uh, but it will take time for that to become clear. What, it, what, what is clear is that India had been benefiting from some of the shifts happening right now. FDI had been increasing there. Markets were certainly on a tear. Um, companies and investors were looking at India or maybe wishing to look at India in a different light than they had been. Um, but of course, there are limitations to that. It's still no China. It's got a, it doesn't have anything like the scale in infrastructure that China offers. So the economy has a long way to go in terms of its development. And clearly, people on the ground may be reflecting that point. And uh, this was me yesterday. I was sitting by the pool here in Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> with Damien Sassar on the phone being like, I don't get it. Break down India, South Africa, and Mexico for me. The stuff he said about India was quite interesting in that now that we have a coalition, Modi is going to have to do something to get those people that are very disaffected by the government and sort of left behind because all you're talking about is some capital investment in the stock market but the people left behind and that means larger budget deficits bigger fiscal deficits more borrowing do you see that uh in the market do you think that that's on the table well that's the corollary the uh, our colleagues in new delhi make the point that the coalition partners he's signed up with are especially unreliable so that would suggest that obviously any incumbent would want to try and do what they can to keep them on side. And if you're trying to keep them on side, that lends itself to the idea of everyone has their pet projects. Everyone will want to invest in spending in their home state. And of course, that suggests there will be more uh, pressure on, on, the, um, on the public finances, be it on welfare, be it on investment in infrastructure or whatever. But we have to wait and see what particular policy does come out of it. But at the very least not just India, but any country where you have a coalition government, that means there has to be trade-offs, that means there has to be compromise, that means everyone has a wish list. And when you have a wish list government to try and keep things together, that in, that typically does mean more pressure on spending. Uh, we'll just have to see how that plays out in, in the months ahead. All right. And uh, so good to chat with you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Enda Curran, he is Bloomberg Global uh, Economy reporter joining us uh, from uh, D.C. So I think that's quite interesting. We'll yep. see. We'll see how much money exactly. they have to spend. But again, I, we've all heard this pitch, I think, over the last several years as China's had its challenges, whether it's government cracking down on business or their economy slowing. Their, you know, Folks will come up to me and say, 
what you guys thought about China for the last 10, 20 years, take that and put it onto India. That's yep. where the opportunity is, and you have better rule of law, better uh, you know, expectations of business, and that can be a real opportunity over the next 10 to 20 years. We'll have to see how this change in government maybe impacts that. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. I'm Alex Steele alongside Paul Sweeney. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news with our analyst lens from Bloomberg Intelligence. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide, and occasionally they let us go on the road and do stuff. So today we are broadcasting live from that magnificent Gaylord Opryland Resort in Nashville for BNY Mellon's 26th annual Insight Conference. They have over 2,000 financial intermediaries from top asset management firms, and I'm grateful that someone is here now from Pershing who's going to give us some insight into technology. Uh, joining us now is Ainsley Simmons. She's president of Pershing. X, head of strategy for BNY Mellons Pershing, and head of product management for BNY Mellons. You do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Easily. That's a lot of titles. <laughs> there you go. So, first off, what is Pershing X? Yeah, Pershing X is a fintech inside of the Bank of New York Mellon that was started about two and a half years ago. So, I was the first employee. My background's in fintechs. And I came to BNY to really drive innovation inside this storied 240 year old institution. So we're never resting on our laurels. We're always moving forward. And doing it with a fintech inside of the bank has been a super efficient way to go. So what are some of the initial products that you guys have been bringing to market for your clients? Yeah, so last year we launched our first product, which is called Wove Advisory. And that really is... W-O-V-E. W-O-V-E, -E, okay. Wove, yeah. The reason we call it Wove is it brings together a lot of disconnected technology. And really that's kind of an advisor workstation, if you okay. think about it. Let's advisors sort of build portfolios, trade them, report on them, everything they need to service a client. Um, this year, we launched three more products, oh so we've been busy. Uh, we launched Wove Data, which is a cloud-based data aggregation service so that advisors can have access to all the data they need to service their clients across any custodian and any firm. We launched Wove Connect, which is a suite of APIs. Lots yep, of people okay. need to build through APIs, and so we've offered that. And then the third product is probably uh, the one I think people are most excited about, which is Wove Investor, which is an investor portal that can be configured to any firm's branding um, so that they can have their investors log into a really simple and easy-to-use experience. Wow. That's, that's a, fintech. See, that's what that's I That's fintech, man, yes, right exactly. there. <laughs> that's what you do? I think, well, I think what happened during the pandemic you were not. You weren't going into your financial advisor. You weren't going into your commercial yeah, lo local just branch. Yeah, you app, right? And so people were forced to get yeah. tech savvy. And sure. I think probably from the provider perspective, you guys were probably forced by the marketplace to make to up more our game, up yeah. our game, make more investments. Absolutely. So what are you hearing from your advisors? What do they What do they really need? Do they want to empower their clients? Do they just want to be smarter when they're talking to their clients? Well, all of the above, all right? The above. Like, So they really want their clients to have a very easy to use experience. And today, um, just given the way the industry's grown up, they are usually having to ask their end investor to log into mul multiple accounts, one for financial planning, one for performance reporting, one for mm. trading. Nobody wants that anymore. So no Wove, one can remember that many no, passwords. No, I can't remember that yeah, many no. passwords. So Wove Investor brings all that together, and that's why I think people are super excited about that product. But you can't pull together a really great investor experience unless you have all the data pulled together. So Wove Data is also a really important product. So Wove Connect, Wove Advisory, Wove Data, Wove Investor, they all create a suite. And the way to think about it is kind of like the Microsoft suite. You know, you got your Outlook, mm -hmm. you got your Teams, and they all work together. That's what we're doing here in Wealth. So when I log on to my Wealth Management site, yeah. and I can see my investments yep, and my yep, bank yep. accounts and my savings and my 401k, and then I see like what the planning is, that's all that stuff. Stuff, and, mm -hmm. and we're putting it all together for any firm, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of large firms have made those investments if you're working with, you know, like a uh, a large wirehouse or, or something like that. But these are um, independent, mostly independent uh, wealth advisors, and they don't have that kind of capital, right, right. Mm -hmm. to build something that end-to-end. -end. So we're doing it for them, and they can own it uh, fractionally uh, and not have to make that massive investment that the Bank of New York Mellon is making on their behalf. What's the business case for the investments that you get? So when you go to your CFO and ask for capital yeah. to make some of these investments, yep. 
what's the business case you make to your CFO? Yeah, so uh, it's pretty easy uh, to make the case for this platform because this helps our uh, Persian custody business. It helps our investment management business. It helps our wealth management business. And it helps our asset manager clients. So because Bank of New York Mellon runs across all of those different um, business lines, this pulls it all together, so it's I, I, I'm I'm the best dollar to spend because it's it's really lifting all all these different business lines across BNY, and that really was the reason that we've made the investment in this platform. So what else then do you work on? I mean, this sounds great. Yeah, done yeah, now, right? done and done. No, never done. So we'll be uh, driving forward uh, with a lot more, and I'll be back here on the stage next year with more releases on Wove. But I've, we've also been working on uh, strategy. So I took over the head of Pershing Strategy uh, back in. November. And what was really exciting is here we were able to release our new mission and our new vision. And let me just quickly run through mm -hmm. it. Our new mission is to uh, help advisors help more people. So we believe that there's not enough advisors in, in, the, in the United States to serve all the clients that need service. So there's not many more people, you know, coming into the industry. So our job is to make the ones that are here more productive so that it can just help more people. So it's pretty simple. And then our new vision is to create the most connected and productive platform for the future of wealth. We really see a world now where everything has to be connected, and that's the mission we're on. So, well, Why aren't more young people coming into the business? Because all I read about is the big macro story of all this wealth from the boomers has to be transferred, yeah. and has to be managed. And it seems like a 20, 30 year runway. It is. So it's, my number three offspring is going into that, uh, that part congrats, of the business. Congrats. Uh, why I've heard from a lot of your colleagues that that's a challenge, right? Yeah, it is a challenge. I think there's some structural challenges. A lot of part of this business is still very, um, you know, kind of commission based, and 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 young people want a, potentially a different kind of onboarding model. Um, but I also just think we have a bit of a PR problem. You know, people don't realize how mission driven being a financial advisor is. You know, you really are helping families create. Mm -hmm. Uh, a different future. And I think if we can sort of change the narrative a little bit, I mean, I hate to use that term, but it is a really noble ambition. And I think uh, a lot of kids um, don't see it that way. They sort of see it as like yucky Wall Street, yep. but it's not that at all. Financial advice is really a community-based, heartfelt type of, of occupation. Especially if you're able to touch families and lives that aren't multi-millionaires, yeah, right? Yeah, like that's the whole thing, right? Like everybody's like, okay, cool. But the reason our help advisors help more people ambition is so strong is, you know, the more we can help advisors be more productive, the, the more sort of lower down the economic chain uh, they can go and we can really truly change lives. So I'm super passionate about it and I think that, uh, you know, we're just going to keep working until we can get millions more. Internally, you know, change for such a large institution that's been around for hundreds of years, especially in the technology sense, can be really hard. Yeah. What kind of mandate do you feel like you were able to have and execute? Like, yeah, how, I how mean, on board is everybody with all the change? I feel so, so privileged because this has been a, you know, kind of top of the house embraced initiative, right? So our, our CEO, Robin Vince, uh, this is one of his, his key initiatives, our CFO, our whole executive uh, office. And people are so supportive. And what they love about this kind of fintech model that we've put together is uh, we're actually now going to start to adopt this whole model firm-wide. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to make the future of Bank, Bank of New York Mellon um, as, as bright as its past has been. And Bank of New York, the best address global financial services okay number one wall street yeah <laughs> how cool is that i mean that's a good is that good pr or bad pr I, in the I environment that we're in right now i always <laughs> i always think it's pretty cool when i think about alexander hamilton as yep. our founder i mean what a visionary what a revolutionary so i i i don't mind sharing and, and those what would you think of bny melon today? i think he'd be pretty proud yeah, I if, so. I, if i if, yeah I, I i certainly hope he would be well i know? think that that's a good recruiting tool you go go on campuses you know that Hamilton musical that you think yeah, is so great? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. this is That's it. your like, man. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Such a good point. Ainsley, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by with us. Ainsley Simmons, president of Pershing X, head of strategy for BNY Mellon's Pershing, and head of product management for BNY Mellon. And Canadian. And, and Canadian. Canadian. There, there you go. so much <laughs> that she does, uh, apparently. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on 
Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Alex Steele, Paul Sweeney, live here in our uh, down in Nashville, Tennessee at the BNY Mellon Insight Conference. We are at the Gaylord Entertainment Grand Opryland. Resort, and this is a serious resort. So if you're done, if you're ever done in the Nashville area, come take a look. They got everything here. All right, Alex and I've been spending the past a day or so talking to a lot of the good folks at BNY Mellon about how they try to serve their investor clients. Let's see the, if they actually get it done here. Noam Tash, he joins us, head of revenue and partnerships at BNY Mellon's Pershing X, and Mohan Guruapakiam, he's a chief information officer at Steward Partners, an investment advisory firm. Uh, so. We got client, we got like the person who kind of works for the client, we got all together here yeah. on one stage. Um, so, Noam, let's talk about, let's talk to you first. What type of investor, what type of client do you guys look for on your platform? What's an ideal type of money management client for you guys at BNY Pershing? Yeah. Aside from Mohan, obviously. Uh, exactly. Obviously, <laughs> Mohan is the ideal, you can share a bit more about that. but. We look at the whole range. We can serve everybody, everything from a traditional broker-dealer to a independent RIA or hybrids. Um, aggregators and you know, fast-growing companies is really where we are. Uh, we believe that heavy tech adopters are the ones that are growing fastest. We actually see research that tells us that uh, advisory firms that adopt tech heavily can see client growth and AUM growth of 3x what others do. And so those are the types of provide of uh, uh, advisors we want to work with because what we're doing is delivering delivering to them the most connected tech mm -hmm. because there's still even for those adopters there's still a lot of challenges and pains that come along with that tech. So Mohan, Steward Partners is actually quite large, right? Can you tell us a little bit about the firm and sort of what works for you that Pershing X is doing? So absolutely, thanks for having us. First of all, so Steward Partners, we are a hybrid RIA, we are a broker dealer and an RIA. We are headquartered in New York. Roughly $35 billion in assets, 270 advisors. A lot of our advisors come from a breakaway uh, firms, from the bulge firms, like big firms. Uh, 70 offices, roughly 26 states, a large uh, footprint. And in terms of our relationship with Pershing, you know, we have two strategic relationships. One is for the custody business, obviously, mm -hmm. right? The biggest player. Um, and, of course, beyond the custody, we are also very excited to be uh, part of the uh, Pershing X. Uh, we are one of the early adapters. Um, we, we just started the rollout, so um, more feedback to come, but we are truly excited by uh, what we're going to see. Mohan, I've heard, or I guess what we've learned over the last couple of days is that the number of advisors out there isn't growing. There's a greater demand. There's more demand for advisors than maybe there are advisors. How do you grow your advisor base? Do you wait for somebody to break away from a bulge bracket firm? Do you you would try to go out there and, and attract them proactively. How does that happen? So we look at two different options. The first one is obviously recruitment, right? There are breakaway advisors. So if you look at the breakaway advisors, they are mostly seeking independence. Uh, that is something that is not well understood. They seek independence in how they run the business. So this is somebody from, say, like a Merrill Lynch or something or Morgan Stanley says, I want to kind of go out on my own a little bit, get a little bit more autonomy? Uh, well, at autonomy in how they run the business. Okay. And that inevitably translates into the technology stack we need to build for them. Mm. Okay. Right? That is one um, one option, but also we are looking at a lot of m and uh, This space is um, mm -hmm. quite, uh, I would say, like active in the m and space. If you look at the number of RAs with more than $10 billion in assets, like 10, 15 years versus where it is right now, that segment is growing really fast. So we look at multiple options. You know, recruitment, we have a very robust pipeline, but also we are very active in the M&A space, and we will not hesitate to go after the right uh, targets. That was one of the topics we actually, Mohan joined me on a panel yesterday, and one of the topics was how do we differentiate leveraging tech in an, a heavily active M&A environment, uh, and how do we recruit and keep those assets at the advisory for, uh, firm? A lot, a lot of that is where we're trying to add in value as, as well. Mm -hmm. offering flexibility, offering connectivity, and really allowing these advisors that are breaking away to still have that comfort of a full stack that oftentimes can be really challenging if you're trying to go out there on your own and start over. How does the relationship between um, client and provider work? Like, does Mohan go to you and is like, look, Noam, I got some problems. I need you to help me fix them. Like, how can you help my efficiency or productivity? Or do you go to them and say, look, 
these things are going to make your lives a lot better, and this is why. How does this evolve? It always starts with the client. <laughs> okay, so so you were like, I need help. It's always a dialogue, right? I think that's the most important part. It's a dialogue. It's it's not, um, you know, uh, it's it's it both it's both ways. We give the feedback in terms of what we hear, what we see. We are much closer to the advisors, right? Because we work with them on a day-to-day basis, and we also, you know like to hear from the broader trends uh, from you know Pershing, Pershing X uh, they, they obviously see a much broader slice of the market than we do so uh, we send feedback, we get feedback we both jointly put together technology strategies to help us move forward. We have a philosophy of meeting our clients where they are and so we're never coming and trying to pitch a widget. Mm-hmm. We're always coming and listening where do you have your biggest pain points and let's figure out how we can help solve those pain points or even advise you as to where we're seeing clients go elsewhere to solve those pain points. Who's your biggest competitor? That's a great question. I think right now, end-to-end, it's a, there's a, uh, different types of competitors. There's the fully outsourced model that we see some clients go to where they're getting everything all in one shop, but they're also, you know, have to sacrifice a bit of their brand and independence. And then there's the assemblers, those clients that, that are going out there and quite literally putting together 12 different pieces of technology. And then you have this new category that we've brought to the market. And so the new category of actually having it curated for you in one spot, I, th- I think it's really a new category. Mohan, what do you want Noam to fix next? <laughs> what are you telling him now? Um, well, uh, stay true to the core philosophy of being flexible but integrated. Right? That is my one feedback, which is you know, we should not lose sight of the broader philosophy, which is to build a technology ecosystem that works for the advisor. They sign our paychecks, so we got to make sure that they are happy <laughs> right. at the end of the day. Yeah. Fair point. All right, guys, thanks for coming by. This was really helpful. We got the lowdown on Wove before, and it's nice to see uh, how In it action. interacts. Yeah. Uh, Noam Tash, he's head of revenue and partnerships at BNY Mellon's uh, Pershing X, and also uh, Mohan Guru Pakiam, a chief information officer at Steward Partners for the interconnection uh, between client and technology. Thank you so much, guys. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney, we are live here in Nashville, Tennessee at the BNY Mellon uh, Insight Conference. We are at the Gaylord uh, Opryland Resort, which is just a spectacular World-class water park, Alex. Did you go yesterday? You're darn right I did. Some kid tried to cut line in front of me. He's going to think twice about doing that again. This Let's is an just leave lesson. it at that. Exactly. This is a good life lesson that one must learn. <laughs> exactly. Hanukkah Smith joins us here. She's a global head of investment management at BNY Mellon. Uh, Hanukkah, I know in the investment management business for BNY Mellon, you guys had a pretty big announcement this morning. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so we actually announced something in collaboration with our colleagues at Pershing, which is why I'm so excited to be here. And that, that's a bundled service offering between Pershing and investment management. So um, Pershing, of course, already offers um, custody, retail managed accounts capabilities. And now what we're also going to be offering clients is access to investment management products, but in a much more cost-effective way than they've been able to access before. And the way this is going to work is that once they're on what we call the WOF platform in this tech-enabled environment, and manage their accounts through Pershing, the more assets they allocate to IM products, the greater the discount, up to 40%. So it's one, going to simplify advisors' life because they it'll free up time through this tech-enabled environment. Um, It's also going to give them choice, and it's also going to reduce the cost, which is really important. What, I mean, aside from the cost, what problem was this trying to solve? Um, so it, 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 it is um, one of the things that it's trying to solve is actually giving advisors more time to spend with their end client because the environment for them is becoming increasingly complex through regulatory pressures, technology pressures. And the first thing that this is we're solving is first through onboarding clients onto the Wove platform or the advisors, which, which is where 
um, they can bring uh, th their technology and their apps. And then secondly, we're going to be helping them by putting institutional quality portfolio advice on that platform and also giving them the full breadth of investment management products as a choice. It seems like this was something that should have been done day one. Why is it happening now? It is happening now partly um, because we uh, we have been working quite hard in inside BNY to um, be more for our clients, as we call it. We have better technology solutions that we uh, didn't have before. And thirdly, and also really importantly, we've been uh, investing time in educating our colleagues that work with the advisors about the expertise that exists in investment management to a degree that we hadn't done before. What, what's been the response so far? Uh, well, we're, it's a day old. Um, <laughs> we, uh, no, we have, of course, tested this with some clients before we sort of rolled it out into the broader market, and it's been very, very well received. And working with some of our key clients, uh, considering uh, these offerings previously, really made us consider that we should roll this out further. As Global Head of Investment Management at BNY Mellon, how are you guys viewing the market here these days when you kind of just start from the 30,000 foot level where do you start so where do you start well it's very difficult uh, not to start without talking about rates what's yep. going to happen and um, we're still of the view that rates will be higher for longer and that, um, that we're coming out of what was an abnormal environment in a very low yep. rate environment notwithstanding that we are expecting perhaps a rate cut later in the year, both here as well as it will be interesting to see what the ECB is going to do tomorrow as well. There's been a tiny uptick in inflation in Europe, but it was really, really tiny. They did seem to be set for a rate cut. Will be I mean, they have telegraphed that rate cut, but if they did I know. it... That I know. would be something <laughs> I know. big. So that's, of course, uh, on investors' mind. But we're keenly, of course, what, really watching what the Fed is going to do. Um, and it does seem that there's some that the economy is slowing down a little bit. I was actually looking through some of the um, figures around hiring. And what's really interesting to see is that the hiring rate is slowing down. Now we're always looking at employment figures, but the hiring rate slowing down, I think, is also a sign, plus the uh, data that we saw coming out of manufacturing may indicate a little bit of a slowdown uh, and may lead to a cut. What I find so interesting about this moment in time is that we're, we're really reversing like 15 years of, of zero yeah. interest mm -hmm. rates and 20 years of no inflation. And now you have a world where fixed income makes money. <laughs> yes. Uh, just from the dividend. Like, I mean, cash. Yeah, but like for cash makes money. I mean, forget about appreciation or anything. You can just make money by sitting there. And I wonder like how that changes what a wealth manager does. I mean, this has been a world that hasn't been seen in like two generations of investors at this point. How does someone with your experience think about that? Well, that in itself is actually quite a big issue, right? We have a lot of people who are just not experienced in this type of environment who on their own actually have considerable experience, maybe 15 or 20 years of investing, but they haven't seen this before and they don't really know how to react. So. It is important that people like us keep training not only our own colleagues, but then also the end advisor as they work with clients, because you, you need to plan for your future. And we do know, of course, we're hitting, um, we're, we're hitting the issue of how clients are going to fund their retirement, and we haven't really solved for that. Um, so you could perhaps, you know, income will be important and in a higher rate environment and inflation coming down, that rate environment will actually be quite helpful with income, but that not that will not be sustainable sort of when you think about retirement sort of over a 15, 20 year term. So you will also have to continue to have some risk, other risk assets in the portfolio with, with a longer term view to both grow your capital base, but also have assets in the portfolio that can generate income. And that whole diversification journey, how to plan for that, is a journey in itself. You know, coming to events like this, I, I, I was always surprised about alternative investments and how they are top of mind on some mm -hmm. of these wealth managers. I thought that was just a big institutional allocation. But retail, I mean, you know, RIAs are thinking about that. How do you 
what are the conversations that you have with some of these people? Well, we are. We were just in a conversation uh, earlier this morning with Jenny Johnson from Franklin Templeton uh, as well. And we are seeing the demands coming through from the end investor. So first of all, you need to think about how we make those investments accessible mm -hmm. to a retail investor because you still need to be a qualified investor to actually access those products. And secondly, you need to make sure that the advisors are appropriately trained to really explain to the end investor the risks that come with the type of investment. Mm -hmm. They can provide a lot of upside. They're obviously... Um, I have to create the opportunity to generate higher returns than what you can achieve in the public markets, both fixed and equities, but the investments are illiquid. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to plan for that, and it does mean that those investments cannot be a very large allocation of end clients' portfolios, and that has to be well understood and appropriately managed from a risk perspective. Like under 10%. Yeah. But I think what's also happening, I think the markets have been running quite hot. There's also fewer listed companies, yep. right? That's yep. just there are fewer companies mm -hmm. going IPO. We've also seen a trend of the delistings. So there's actually fewer companies available. So if you want to invest, say, in the U.S. economy, you kind of have to go private. Such great insight. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for stopping by. Congratulations on unveiling uh, your new suite of products. Uh, Hanukkah Smits, a global head of investment management for BNY Mellon. And that's so interesting. It's like, yes, you're going to have alternative assets be a part of the portfolio, but I don't know if we know just how much that's going to be. And you mentioned that 10% number. I remember being in a conversation in one of these events a couple of years ago, and some retail advisors were saying, no, 20, 30, 40%. I mean, it, it, that's kind of almost like an endowment allocation when That's you go to a, yeah when you go to like a, an endowment and so that really surprised me that they're willing to take that level of risk on mm -hmm. uh, or the probably their clients are probably willing to take that level of risk on so it's private equity private credit hedge funds mm -hmm. all those types of things uh, are out there you're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news in finance and business through our lens of our Bloomberg Intelligence analysts. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. Uh, for the last two days, we've had the honor of being right here in Nashville, Tennessee, broadcasting live from the magnificent Gaylord Opryland Resort in Nashville for BNY Mellon's 26th annual Insight Conference with over 2,000 financial intermediaries from top asset management firms. We've seen a lot of guests that we usually have on TV just strolling by. Seeing them in person is always really fun. And we were just ended the last conversation on alternative alternatives, and we could not find a better person than to talk to about alternatives. Lisa Lewin is Director of Prime Services at BNY Mellons Pershing, and she joins us here. Lisa, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So we were just talking uh, to Hanukkah about um, alternatives and what part they should play in their portfolio and sort of how, what the risk allocation should be. You were on a panel earlier that talked about just that. What were some of your takeaways? Yep, absolutely. So we moderated a panel yesterday that was on the topic actually around the democratization of alternatives. And what we really focused on was the trend that we've seen over the last several years here at BNY Mellon Pershing where there's been an increased interest from advisors and other clients in the wealth management channel to allocate or increase their allocations to alternative investments. So that's obviously been very exciting for us since we work with both alternative investment managers but also advisors to help them navigate kind of what that means for their business, what they should be thinking about, how they should look at alternative strategies, where those can fit into their asset allocation. And that's really what we focused on during our discussion yesterday. Like I came to one of these events a couple of years ago and I was talking to an advisor and I thought that their allocation would have been 5%, 10%. It's a lot higher. What's your experience about what some of these uh, wealth advisors think about in terms of allocation to um, alternatives? Great question. So it's actually really varied from what we've seen in the advisory community, and that really depends a lot on the advisor, kind of their comfort and education level with alternatives, um, their profile of their clients that they service. We see more that right now advisors have more of a, I would call it maybe 
2 to 5% allocation to alternatives, but the data that we've seen and the statistics from when we've talked to our clients in this space is that they're actually looking to increase their allocation to alternatives to closer to 10 to 15% of their clients' overall portfolio weighting. So where's the risk here? So usually when we talk about private investments, like they just are alternative investments. I think of cre- private credit. I think of crypto, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. They haven't been around very long. So what's the conversation around risk management? Excellent question. There's definitely a lot of conversation around risk management, and that really folds into the lo- larger conversation, which is around education and the need for education. And Alex, I think to your point, one of the biggest challenges that both advisors and alternative investment managers have is trying to provide the education to these clients who have not been as traditionally invested in these types of strategies about why they're beneficial in their portfolios. So it's talking about everything from risk to liquidity to, you know, where they provide diversification from your traditional stock and bond investments to how you should bucket them in your overall allocation. All of that is kind of part of the conversation that is still being had in in education that, um, you know, a lot of people are looking to provide in this space. All right, I grew up with private equity and with hedge funds, hedge funds as my main alternatives. Now this new thing, private credit, has come in and become such a huge market. What's the view of, of, of BNY Mellon Pershing on the private credit market? The private credit market has definitely been huge. Um, one of the things that my panel has actually talked about yesterday is that private credit strategies have actually seen the most inflows from their advisor yep. clients. Um, so they've seen certainly a lot of interest in private credit strategies. You know, one of the things that we've also heard is that a lot of the managers of these private credit strategies have really been kind of on the forefront of creating structures that make it more, like a little easier for these clients to access their strategies. So that certainly helped as well. But they can, we continue to see, and my panelists talked about this yesterday, a lot of interest in private credit and inflows into those strategies. How do you think that investors and wealth managers are using private credit? Is it long-term riskier bets that will return more than, say, the stock market? Is it just, hey, let's just throw some money here, see what happens, because money's going there and it could be a really good return? Like, what's the best use of it? Excellent question. Um, I think the best use of it from what we're seeing is, again, like another way to diversify away from that traditional kind of 60-40 portfolio allocation that so many people have traditionally stuck to. Um, is another way to maybe provide kind of higher returns for their clients, uh, you know, diversification, again, away from the public markets. So that's really how we're seeing clients use these private credit strategies. In the past, how I've interacted with Prime Services is, you know, I've got some trader on Morgan Stanley's equity or bond desk, and she has a great three or four years, and she takes that uh, track record and says, call, calls you up and says, go raise me a billion dollars. or see how much money you can raise. I want to go out on my own. Does that happen anymore? Well, maybe not that not as easy as you describe, but certainly one of the services that we do provide our clients is what's called capital introductions. So we help our hedge fund and other alternative asset management clients meet potential investors to raise capital. So that is certainly something that we do. We also work with our clients to structure different financing arrangements and to facilitate uh, any type of securities lending activity if they have a shorting component to their strategy. What What else are you guys talking about that we don't know about yet that, like, the clients are saying, like, this is a really cool alternative that we have to start talking about in, in, in a different way? Oh, good question. Um, a few things. I think one of the things that I found interesting in my panel yesterday is that they're seeing a lot of inflows into, in addition to private credit, also to PE secondaries. I thought that was oh, interesting. interesting. And that they're also starting to see more interest in inflows into real estate credit. Uh, Um, So I thought that those were kind of two interesting things that they highlighted that are trends that we certainly plan to continue to watch. PE secondaries. Yeah, I know. So is crypto in your world? So we crypto is in our world. I do not not really deal with crypto, and I will be the first to admit I am not the expert on the space. Like I don't know if it's an alternative. Is it a currency? Is it a commodity? I I don't know. But I think that's kind of the issue, right? Like if you're a wealth manager, like management manager, how do you pitch that, and what percentage of your portfolio should that be? Excellent question. I no one knows. No one knows, and I think part of that is just around no one really 
fully understands crypto. Yeah, I think that's fair to say, except for the just the real, maybe the grayscale people over there, they have the nice big booth this year, mm-hmm. so maybe they do. Maybe it's the young kids. Yeah, it's, it's that, the kids. That's what I was yeah. going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta, you got to ask someone that's young. <laughs> yeah. They'll maybe understand young. it. <laughs> All right, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Lisa Lewin, she's a director of Prime Services at BNY Mellon Pershing. We're live here uh, in Nashville, Tennessee at the Gaylord Opryland Resort for the BNY Mellon Insight uh, uh, get together here, uh, which they do every, every year, and here we're in Nashville. So good stuff here. We're gonna talk to a lot of smart people about the wealth management business, learning a lot as well. I have to say, I did learn a lot. Yeah, I know. I don't think I really understood what like Pershing did at BNY Mellon and how instrumental it is to the functioning of like my yeah. wealth manager. Yeah, and so the next time you're on Wall Street, go to number one Wall Street on the corner. That's the original site of the Bank of New York. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, good stuff. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.